good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are um, in the world. And thanks for joining us for our June DG community chat, even though it is in July. Um, but it's still the, still the June, June event, and, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Um, Dan and I are delighted to be joined tonight by Nick Robinson, and Nick is the CEO and founder of International Sports Consulting, um, a sports management marketing and consulting business with expertise managing some of the biggest athletes across a variety of sports. And I think I'm led to believe that he has um, a client attending the Tokyo 2020 games with Zoe Smith in the weightlifting um, category, which is which is fantastic. And um, the the company always uh, sorry they also advise governing bodies and rights holders and strategy and sponsorship acquisitions um, and very much work with brands to create partnerships. Well, I think we've got a few with Jim Shark and like Dre Beats and a few other really um, great partnerships with it with their clients. So yeah, very much looking forward to this this chat. Um, as ever, this call has been recorded so we can share over our social platforms and on our podcast. So if anyone has any problems with this, please just drop me an, um, an email afterwards. And um, basically how this format is going to be is that Dan and I are just going to ask Nick some questions about his career. Um, and as always, please feel free to put any questions in the chat and we will um, ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask Nick these questions um, directly. But um, yeah, this is just a different um, conversation than the one that we've had before, especially with Nick being in the sports agency um, world, um, which would be good for an insight into this kind of um, sector. So um, yeah, I hope everyone enjoys it. But if anyone's got any questions or whatnot, the chat function I think is still at the bottom. Yes, it is. So yeah, please feel free just to ask any questions. Um, but the first question that I am going to ask Nick is basically just to give us, um, you know, an insight into what you know why you wanted to become a sport agent and um, how your careers kind of evolved from from there. Yeah, hi Jody, and um, thanks very much for having me on. It's nice to meet, and uh, Dan, good to see you again. Um, yeah, so so to answer your question, um, I. Uh, I, I finished school actually not knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I, I was playing rugby at quite a high standard um, at that at that point, and um, I finished school and I went to university in Bristol um, and studied there whilst also playing um, for Bath Rugby Club, so just not not too far down the road. Um, I suffered quite a few injuries around that time, that, that first year of university, last year of school, I spent most of it injured, I ruptured my ACL, I dislocated my shoulder quite a few times, and it was around that time that I stopped playing. Um, but I hadn't really thought much past my the end of university at that stage. Um, and then I finished university, finished my degree, um, and I that was in 2003, and the, the Rugby World Cup was on a couple of months after that in Australia. So I went down to Australia and I, um, I enjoyed traveling and supporting the England team in the, you know, we won the world cup, which was unbelievable. And, um, and then I came back and I, um, I, I just looked for internships and I did an internship at IMG. Um, and, um, it was, it was IMG where I really sort of crystallized what I wanted to do, that I wanted to become an agent. I, I was rubbing shoulders with agents there. And um, the advantage of it was that I saw all of the um, different aspects of working in a sports business. So we had a consulting division, which is where my internship was. Um, we had, you know, um, advertising, you know, so on, so on TV or perimeter boards. Um, we had you know, uh, television studio, TWI, I think it was called at the time. So we had every different type of business that you would want to work in within sports. But it was hearing the agents in the side offices talking about games that they'd been to, players that they'd seen, deals that were happening. That really seemed to spike my interest. And um, that was when I decided that I wanted to become an agent. Um, and then the, the challenge then was getting a job as an agent. Um, so... I I just reached out to every contact that I had, and I was fortunate to have quite a few from my playing days, you know, people who, who were players and had agents. And I reached out to all sort of the agencies, the agents at the time, um, 
I leveraged every possible contact that I could think of to see if I could get him in, in the door. And uh, it didn't happen straight away. I had to, you know, there's just a lot of no's. So I had to go and take a job um, working in, uh, in uh, marketing for, for about a year. I continued to apply. It was a stepping stone for me. And uh, I got feedback from one of the agents that, I, that they wanted. It was good they had a sports background and that I had the, quite a few contacts that were players. Um, but he was looking for someone with more of a sales experience because ultimately, as an agent, you're selling yourself you're to the players, you're selling your players to the clubs or to brands. Um, so he was looking for, the CV was good, but he was looking for more sales experience. So I started, I took that on board, that, that advice and feedback, and I started looking for jobs um, within the sports sector um, in a sales role. So I, I worked for a company called The Sportsman, which is a news, uh, sports betting newspaper selling advertising for them. Um, so I did that for a good year or so until that company, the, the newspaper stopped existing. It didn't make enough money, didn't sell enough copies, so it stopped existing. Uh, but the whole time I was, this was all just stepping stones. I was always still applying, trying to leverage whatever contacts I have, trying to learn about the industry, trying to find a way in. And... I, the, the, the sports newspaper went under and I also, I needed a job at that stage because they, it went into administration. So we got no severance package. We, were, we got nothing. So I was 20, maybe 24, 25 years old by that stage and um, I didn't know where my next uh, month's rent was going to get paid. Um, so I, uh, I, I managed to get offered a job in the city um, as a carbon trader, as a trader. And which, which was great. Um, and at the same time, I, I was still pushing for jobs as a, as a sports agent. And I had actually had it seemed like a little bit of interest from, from an agent that, uh, that said maybe they were looking to bring someone in on the commercial side to sell, um, spot, to find sponsors for their players. And uh, so I said to the, um, the, the trading company, I said, look, thanks for the offer. Let me just give you an answer within a week, okay? Uh, so that was on the Monday, and um, or I think the Friday maybe, and and I thought, look, I, I really really want to try and get this job as an agent. Like, you know, I've been trying for for you know, three years now, and I feel like I'm really close, and I don't want to take this job and 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 then miss that opportunity. But at the same time, I need to pay my rent, so you know, I'm going to try as hard as I can for a week, and if I can't get it within a week, then um, I'll, uh, I'll take the jobs in, in the city. And then on the Friday, on the very last day, um, I got the call from the sports management company and they, they offered me the job. And it was on easily half or a third of the money of the job in the city, but I didn't hesitate. You know, I, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I took it straight away. And I've, I'm often, I've often looked back at that time and thought that was a real sliding doors moment, you know, if I'd have taken that job in the city and, you know, let's say I'd had a good six months or so and done quite well and earned some money, I wonder if I ever would have um, made, you know, come back down this route and ended up working in sports as an agent. Or and I don't know if that would have been better or worse, actually. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was definitely a sliding doors moment. And that's, um, and that's how I began. And it's interesting within the first couple of weeks, maybe even the first morning of being an agent, I just, I was so excited. I had such a buzz. I had butterflies in my stomach. I was meeting the other agents. And, um, you know, I very quickly realized that this is what I wanted to do. I felt like I was ready to put all my weight into this and, and be super ambitious about it. Um, and, and I sensed an ambition that I hadn't sensed before. I was, you know, kind of cruising before really, um, I always felt like I was on a stepping stone to the, to, to becoming a, an agent or, or being something that I, something else. Um, whereas this one, I just thought I want, uh, I, this is what I really want to do. I want to make a success of it. And, um, it, it took me to a new level of ambition and drive because I, I realized how hard these jobs were to come by and I didn't want to let that go. I, you know, I knew I had to do everything that I could to, to keep this job. And the first, the first six months, a year, really tough because, you know, you're 20. I was 25 at the time, I think. And 
I, I didn't really know what I was doing, understandably. I mean, I, you know, I, I only just started the job. And I had to try and persuade players to sign with me. Um, so immediately, you know, you, you're not going to be able to sign, I mean, unless you're an unbelievable salesperson, you're not going to be able to sign players that are anywhere near your age group. You know, as an agent, you're not going to If you're 20... 28 year old play you're not going to sign with a 25 year old agent who's younger than you and has just started out in the industry so you know you're looking at academy boys 18 year olds 19 year olds um and um you know and it's very tough and you're kind of in a race against basically your boss's patience to be able to deliver and um you know, and so that that was the time where I, I, I really had to pull out all those contacts that I kind of used up to try and get a job as an agent. I then once again was going back to them being like, help me get any players. Does anyone know anyone? Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I just, you know, I remember when I managed to sign my first player, it was... Um, it was funny, I was, I was, I was so nervous. Um, but I signed my first player and then I managed to sign his friend and um, and another one of his team members, and you know I just did a good job. I was I was up in and around the club the whole time, and um, and then it it kind of went from there. But um, you know I've never really lost that that ambition, you know, to do well and be kind of happy with where I am uh, since then. And that was coming up to fifteen years ago, you know. Um, but that that was the beginning, and I guess the lesson for anyone who's kind of thinking about joining uh, or, or going down that route is you know not to be too worried if you're you know particularly for me I you know I finished university and I I didn't know what I wanted to do you know um I I really didn't and even for the first year I was sort of you know I, I thought I wanted to be involved in sports and I was okay with that I was pretty relaxed about it um you know so I guess that would be my lesson to anyone is don't if you if you're if you're a graduate or if you're joining university or in university and you're not really sure, I wouldn't, you know, don't worry about it. Um, I think uh, exposing yourself to many different people and industries and parts of industries is, is the best thing to do. And, and eventually you'll find something that, that really kind of grabs your attention and you think this is actually, I can really get stuck into this. I can really spend, dedicate my time um, towards this yeah, no, that, that was really fascinating. And Dan and I have spoken about this before in terms of building relationships and reaching out to your network and spending time doing that. And um, from your own story itself and your own journey, that obviously worked for you to an extent as well. Like you know, reaching out to, play, to people that, that you knew and in, in terms of they could help you um, as well. Dan and I, I spoke about that in, in great length, um, especially you know, LinkedIn connections or attending events or conferences or, or, or whatnot. So it's, it's good to know that, um, you know, put the effort in, in that way, you know, further down the line, these people as well may be able to help you in your time of need as well, which is which is great. And that's kind of what, exactly what you've um, what you've touched on, um, which was uh, which was fascinating. Um, and it's good, good to know as well that like you didn't necessarily know what you wanted to do from, a, you know, from when you left uni and you just explored different options and you found out what worked for you and what didn't and then you took the risk on yourself and you took a choice for yourself you know whether I go for this city job or whether I don't and you believed in yourself enough to that opportunity was going to come and whilst you might have thought it didn't it may have not come it did come in at the right time and you just pursued it and you've got that burning ambition to, to keep going and I think that's um key and also you mentioned that you've had you know, a lot of rejections a lot of no's and you know success it wasn't instantaneous for you either like you've worked really hard and um, all these stepping stones as well which I think is quite a good thing to to acknowledge um as well and in, in kind of anyone's journey like success isn't instant and it's often the stepping stones that you take in the background that often go unnoticed but actually they help you you know in the in the long term um as well but on on that um, I mean when you were I guess when you were pushing through or doing the things that you were doing what type of things have you seen you know others do well or or not so well in terms of you know um getting into the sports agent world like um if you heard of you know good stories or bad stories or, or tips to avoid or things to not do or things to do um for anyone who's interested in that kind I of think field. For anyone trying to get into uh, the industry um 
I suppose we, we get quite a lot of CVs and applications on, on a pretty regular basis because, you know, like I, like I was back then, you know, there, there's a lot of people that, that want to get into sports kind of with, without really knowing, really knowing the sort of the minutiae of what, what it takes and just, you know, but, but nonetheless being interested. Um, and the, 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 Look, I think first of all, if you can, if you can, ha if you know someone that can make an introduction for you, I would 100% do that because, um, for whatever reason, it carries a lot more weight, you know. And sometimes, you know, that that person, you know, might, you know, have an have an existing relationship with the person that's introducing you. They might owe them a favor, um, or you know, for for various reasons, they might give you, you know. Um, Five minutes of their time right but not everyone has that you know so in the absence of that what i would do is um i would uh what when applying if you're applying as you know from a sort of cold email or a cold perspective i would try and make your application as relevant as possible to the company that you're working for and uh, my, my number one tip would be not to send a blanket email um saying I, I'm passionate for sports and I would love to work for your company. Um, and um, I would also, you know, e even if you're saying, look, I'm willing to do absolutely anything, I'm willing to make the team, I'm willing to do this, um, you still these days need to go further. Um, and by that, I mean, you need to show somehow and very quickly that you've got the dedication required to make a success of that. So how, so how would you do that? in in a quick email for me the best way is to have shown uh, research in the company right so show something that you know demonstrates you've already done a lot of reading about the company and you, you're you know you're you're willing to put that time in to research the company and um and offer a personal opinion on some aspects of the company or how for instance you might help out in a certain area and i've spoken to daniel about this before but, you know, we have got, you know, footballers, we represent rugby players, um, you know, Olympians, Paralympians. Um, you know, I, I, the, the stuff that stands out for me is when someone says, you know, I love this campaign that you did with your, you know, British weightlifter Zoe Smith. You know, it really resonated with me for these reasons. You know, I'd love to help out by, you know, possibly talking to brands about developing this side of her, you know, of her portfolio or um, something that shows someone is quite switched on and will immediately be beneficial to the company rather than um, someone who's actually is going to take up the company's time um, and needs training up. You know, everyone needs training up. I understand that. But as a company, you're not looking at um, who's out there that you can help. You know, the reality of it is you're looking at how can you continue to grow as a company and keep doing well, keep doing deals and signing athletes and players, right? Um, there's such a limited amount of hours in the day. Um, it's not, it's not appealing to be um, wanting to help lots of graduates kind of get their first rung of the ladder and, and, and develop their own career. You know, as much as, you know, part of, part of what we do is that um, it's not the first thing that jumps out, right. In an application. So, Try and put yourself in the in the eyes of uh, of the employer, and make yourself as appealing as possible to to that um, to that company. You know, uh, and I, I say this to some of my junior agents. I, I, I say, look, imagine when you're pitching a player to a club, right? Imagine imagine if you're the manager of that club or you're the sporting director. What kind of emails and CVs and you know communications do you want to receive what's going to actually help you achieve your goals to win these games etc right and, and that can you know that's a big lesson that i learned is to always try and look at both sides of every conversation and what what are the goals of the person on the other side of the table and how can you help them realize those goals um whilst also you know getting your getting your own um you know what you need out of that as well but if but you know if you're not if you're not helping them realize their their goals then it's probably not going to happen for you i think that's uh, an excellent advice 
on your good hand, I just say, just would say that's absolutely mm-hmm. amazing advice. Um, I think you can apply that to every kind of situation in in, in any job, whether it be sport agency or any like law job or, or anything else. I think that's fantastic advice. Dan, what you what you say? Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say. I think um, it, it's a, I completely agree with everything that that Nick said there, and we've talked about it at length. You know, the two of us and in various conferences that we've spoken at as well in Korea development stuff and and one of the points that i was just going to ask nick about which i know you've you've thought about at length because of the 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 fantastic relationships that you've developed inside and outside of sport is you know i think one of the things that is a miss um misunderstood sometimes and undervalued are the relationships um that agents have to develop with a range of stakeholders in um, in sport, for example. So the talent that you represent, the clubs that you're trying to sell into or get players out of, the brands and understanding their position and the people that work with, with those type of entities. You know, um, how rugby is different to football, is different to weightlifting, is different and, and nuanced to all of the other types of um, uh, clients that you're working with. When, when you're looking to build and think about building relationships, Nick, what are some of the, the the important things that, looking back now, you 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 know you think you did well that you see others do well that are sort of the the, the foundations for, for 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 building an agency practice? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I think um, you know. One of the things that I picked up pretty early, um, because when, when I joined the agency business, I just thought that right, the, the kind of stereotypical agent was these really strong negotiators that would get the absolute best deal for their clients and were very aggressive and dominant, and um, and that was the way you would you would get your you know you would kind of get the the result that suits your agenda. Um, but I, whilst I've seen those types of agents around, I very quickly learned that there are, there are so many other ways to do that. And actually, some of the best agents are, the best way to describe them are just some of the nicest people you could have met. You know, they're very switched on and um, they, they realize that it takes two, to, you know, to, there's two parties to every agreement. And sometimes with us, certainly in my role, there's up to five parties in every agreement. You know, I, it's like some of the shirts that are behind me, um, you know, they we had to get to an agreement between, um, you know, the English club that's buying the player, um, the player, uh, myself, the club um, that uh, has got the rights to the player and the agent of the player in France or Spain or whatever country that was in. Um, so everyone has to agree there. So actually, um, diplomacy is one skill that I... I we didn't realize it was that important. Um, and, but, but I now it's probably one of our greatest attributes. Um, uh, professionalism as well for me um, is, uh, is one that, that's how you build your reputation, you know, and we, we're very lucky that, you know, we have clubs recommend us as, uh, as an agency because they know that people are going to get agents and um, that the kids are going to get agents. And actually, there are a lot of agents they don't want to be dealing with because they're just an absolute nightmare to, to, to deal with. They're, they're uneducated about uh, market values um, and they're constantly moving their players around or, or giving them poor advice. You know, I see that still to this day. You know, we, had, we worked with the agent of a player who gave his player the worst advice in terms of his valuation on the market and um, he, he was telling the player that the, the deal that he should get, the, con- the, va- the contract that he should get on his next deal was significantly higher than what every single club was able to offer. And that's because the market had shifted significantly because of COVID restrictions. And uh, the clubs have got a lot less money than usual, you know, bar the sort of the Uniteds and cities and the, the big clubs like that. Most of the clubs are under enormous financial pressure. And actually they're looking to offload costs, these bumper free transfer deals that, you know, perhaps around two years ago, um, they just don't carry the same weight anymore. But the agent of the player didn't didn't appreciate that, advise a player of this value that he should be seeking. And there wasn't one club who was willing to, to offer that. And actually the renewal terms of the club that he was at were unbelievable in the current market. 
Um, but under the advice of his agent, he rejected that. Now this poor player is scratching around, looking at offers that are, you know, nearly half of the offer they had on the table only three months ago. Um, so, uh, you know, being being really educated in terms of market value is, is hugely important. Being professional and making you, making people want to do repeat business with you is uh, is very important because there's only a certain amount of clubs that 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 are out there. And whilst yes, there is quite a changeover in terms of managers, things like the CEOs of clubs, the sporting directors, they don't turn over quite so quickly. And they're the ones that you have to deal with. And if you burn your bridges with one. It's going to be a lot harder to do a deal the next time, and that's just human nature, you know. And um, you know, you 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 see that you, you see agents that kind of have their golden periods where they um, they're doing huge deals and they're 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 absolutely burning bridges with clubs or brands or whatever that may be. Um, and so, for kind of a golden period of one or two years, they're they're doing unrivaled deals. Um, but then, you know, sooner or later, they burn the bridges with all the big stakeholders that, that are out there that they need to do business with, and they just don't want to do business with that person. And actually, their wins get longer and longer in between each win, and they kind of, you know, within five years, those were, they're looking back at glory days that don't exist anymore. So, you know, you, you've got to understand the market. That's not to say, you know, your role as an agent is still to get the best deal for your player. Uh, you know, make no, there's no question about that. But understanding what is the best deal, um, you know, and where that stands in the pecking order, because often it's not purely financial. You know, sometimes the best deal might quite often won't be the the most well paid, but it will be everything else that comes around it. The club's ambition, who the manager is, what style of play they, they play, where does the manager see you um, and how is your career going to going to flourish at that place? There's also family things, you know, there, there are some families that don't want to move abroad, they don't want to move to certain areas, kids are really settled at school. There's lots of factors to, to bring in, uh, to consider, and um, you've got to do the best deal for, for your player or whatever that may be. I'm going to just ask one more interlinked point on that, Nick, if I can. Um, and, and just obviously in the meantime, for everyone else that's listening in to Nick's real words of wisdom here, please feel free just to raise hands, uh, ask questions in the chat box, and Jojo will come to you in due course because I think this is a really great opportunity just to dig into one of the uh, detail with one of the you know UK and Europe's leading agents in a lot of ways for the, for the fantastic deals that um, Nick has done. But Nick, if I could just ask one question because I know you had a really um, interesting, we had, we've had previous discussions on this, which is you know when we're talking about relationships, one part of relationship building or otherwise is sometimes having difficult conversations. Um, I think it's probably fair to say. Um, that might be, just as you said, um, telling a player he's not as valuable as he or she thinks they are, um, having difficult conversations when disputes or things happen with clubs um, or conflict with clubs generally um, and looking out for best interests. As an agent, you obviously, to a degree, are dealing with conflict or trying to find solutions to, to conflict situations in transactions. How have you, if, if your approach has evolved, or how have you over the years dealt with having those difficult conversations and trying to turn them into positives, really, I guess, if that's the right way of putting it? Yeah, I mean, it depends a lot on the nature of the conversation, really. You know, I mean, I, I had a, a tough conversation today where I told a player who's 33 years old that that's basically the end of the road. You know, um, he's on a free transfer. We were going to look at opportunities for him. And uh, and ultimately, he hadn't played much in the last 18 months, quite a lot of injuries. And at that age, he suddenly just wasn't appealing to clubs anymore. And the player was, um, you know, I don't think he was quite ready to accept that this was the end and he now had to go and look at a different, you know, it's career part two for him now, you know, and well, what does the rest of his life hold? Because in his own mind, he's still the player that he was at 25. You know, he's still ready to do it. He's still got all the skills. And, and in short bursts, he can certainly do that. And, and, you know, I actually think if he went to a club, um, it then he, he would be valuable to that club. But the reality of it is clubs, you know, they're not seeing the same the same side of the coin that you're seeing. They're just seeing someone who's 33, hasn't played in 18 months, has not got a good injury record, and um, and it's just too risky an investment. So, you know, those are 
you know, those are those are different conversations you have to have. Um, you know, there, there's been absolutely loads over the time. We, you know, I, I once travelled to France with a club to negotiate a contract a transfer for a player, and um, and the the club went in. They, you know, we, they had the sporting director and the um, uh, chairman went into went into the boardroom, and um, they couldn't agree. It was, it was uh, with the president of the club in France. And they went back and forth for two hours. They waited outside, and they they couldn't agree. And then they left. You know, stormed out and left, and sort of very acrimoniously. And um, then I, myself and one of my French colleagues had to go in and and basically kind of clear up that whole mess. And uh, we managed to get a price that was mutually agreeable between the two parties. But, you know, it wasn't an easy conversation because the club were completely, you know, putting their foot down on, on you know, w what their valuation was. But ultimately we had to demonstrate to them that, you know, this was in their best interest and, and the alternative certainly wasn't um, because the player's motivation wasn't there. Um, we thought that this was the peak of his uh, of his value, and there are certain factors built in, certain kickers that if he achieves certain things, there was a resale value, you know, and actually ended up being a great deal for the club because the player went to his next club and and sort of plateaued a little bit. So you know, his value never reached what it was on that final deal. You know, th those are tricky conversations to have um, to convince very experienced negotiators. You know that that actually they need to move their position a little bit. You know, um, so there there's been, you know, all, all kinds of issues where diplomacy and honesty is is the key. And and I think as long as you're confident in your road, and as long as you can look yourself in the mirror, you know, every day, every night, and say I've I've given completely honest advice. Because the one thing is a lot of this is subjective. You know, there's not there's not if it was an objective answer it would be easy you know but you're you're giving your own assessment of the situation and um you know i think you have to be very smart about it um try and put all the facts on the table right and then give your and then give your opinion you know and, and often it's a player's decision in the end you know so so that uh, this is just my opinion but you're the one who has to live with this you know at the end of this day i'm going to go back to my wife and kids you know, and then I'm going to go back into the office tomorrow. You know, your life is going to change dramatically based on what happens in this room today. So, you know, um, I think just being honest and transparent with 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 athletes is is the best that you can be. Um, but by the nature of an athlete's career, not every conversation is going to be rosy. I think that's true, though, and I think the fact that you almost mentioned the word honesty um, in all of the difficult difficult conversations is key because actually I think you almost get valued more as an agent or as a lawyer or whatever if you are honest with the other person like with your client like they're going to I think they respect you more if they, if they tell yeah they might not like what you're going to say but if you say what it is you know in a, in a sense of this is what I think and x y and z rather than the, them just thinking about what, what they think you should say like you're saying what the fact that it is I think that um on reflection is, is is good for for all involved Dan, would you agree completely think so and um you know it's very difficult to find that line i've seen nick do it brilliantly on a number of occasions and that was one of the the next questions i was going to ask in terms of honest conversations is that you know and some of the most important relationships nick that we we've talked about previously are with the buyers of your players' services, you know, the, the clubs, what we're talking about here. And in a lot of cases, it's sometimes difficult to get hold of clubs and develop those relationships with the decision makers so that then, you know, when you phone them because you think you've got a player that fits their system, their style, their budget, whatever else it might be, that not only will they pick up the phone to you, but they'll take you seriously in those discussions that, that happen. And I, I recall one story you were telling me about um, a club who whose sporting director cancelled on you in the last minute, but you still really needed to have that conversation with them, and you deciding to, you know, um, try and meet him and then, take, without giving away the story, take him somewhere in order to to have the conversation. It'd be great just to let maybe let the listeners know as much as you can, Nick, about you know having to be pretty assertive in particular situations, find solutions to. To, to be able to have those pretty important conversations with with club officials at the right time. Yeah, now, are you referring to Uwe Rosler? I was going to let you talk. Yeah, exactly. That was what I was thinking yeah. about. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. No, I mean, that that was, um, you know, and actually, Dan, you're excellent at this, but, you know, you, you're, you're, you know, you're very good at, you know, and sometimes I've come to you with a, with a problem that we need, we need to try and optimize. Um, and, you know, the, the attitude is always just get, finding, finding the easiest way to get to yes, you know, I think how you say it. But so, yeah, that was an exact example. You were Rosler. I was trying to meet him for, for quite a long time. We had some really good players that I wanted to put into him. He was manager of Brentford at the time, though, now obviously Premier League. And, um, um, and I really wanted to be in front of him to be able to sell, you know, our players to him because it's quite hard with, you know, an email or a text that, you you know, you can never really get across. Um, you, you, you know, you can't represent and market your player that effectively by text or email because ultimately they're just going to read it. You know, they could be in the car. They could be just the first thing into their office. They might not even read it at all. They might skirt over it. Whereas a conversation you know, is, is a back and forth. It's, uh, you know, you, you can challenge, you know, you can read how that, um, you know, how the other person is, is affected by, by what you're saying. You know, you can see if they're not interested, you can see if they are interested, then you can push a little bit further or you can try and say it in a different way until you're getting that kind of excitement that you need for a manager to sign a player. So, you know, it was one of the clubs I hadn't seen and I thought we had some, some really good players and, and I'd actually heard as well that um, the manager was interested in this player that we happen to represent, you know, as well. Um, so um, we were finally due to meet at the training ground and then he called me really early that morning, said, Nick, actually, I'm going to have to cancel. I've got to, I've got to meet, uh, I've got a meeting in Leeds. Um, and, I, and I asked him, um, how is he getting to Leeds, you know? And he said, well, I'm going from the training ground to uh, getting a cab in, you know, shortly to the to King's Cross and then I'll take the train up. And I knew that Brentford to King's Cross is about 40 minutes. Um, so I just off the spur said, look, well, I'll tell you what, let's cancel the taxi, right? I'm not going to take any time out of your day. I'm going to, I'm going to get you to the station as, as efficiently as a taxi, but let me take you, right? So I drove to Brentford training ground, picked him up like a taxi driver <laughs> and, uh, and then just drove him the whole way. But as he was next to me, I said, look, here's our list of players. You know, I'd love to talk you through some of them. And, um, and so we had basically our meeting, you know, in a car on the way to the train station. And he loved it because he thought it was very efficient, you know, and, um, and it, was, it was no one had ever done that before. But I think that's, a, you know, that's a good way of how you've got to be agile and, you, and you've got to find ways to, to, to get your agenda, you know, across the line because it's not, you know, no, no job is really easy. I mean, otherwise everyone do that and make loads of money, but a sports agent in particular, you know, is very challenging because there's so many people who want to do it. You know, I think there's, I don't know, two and a half, 3000 agents now in England, you know, since they, since they unregulated it, there used to be 500, you know, so you could you could argue that it's become five times harder just in you know five years than it used to be. Um, so, you know, you've really got to find ways to win. And and to be honest, for me, I quite like that because um, uh, I, I you know as a former sportsman, you know, I was you know you you're trained to to win. You know, you you train to win, you play to win. And for me, I, I love the challenge of it, you know, and I get a, you know, get a buzz off doing deals and I get a buzz off signing players and, and representing them. So, you know, um, and I, I enjoy, I enjoy how hard it is, not every day, but most days. Um, so, you know, I think you've got that in you. So if it's in your DNA, then, then, then it suits you. But, you know, like, like with their, like, like running out on a pitch, your tactics have got to be right. You know, and you, you've occasionally got to come up with some pretty uh, unique plays to uh, to get the win. So about, about standing out though and thinking outside the box because that you know that that, that ride will always like I will always remember that ride. I will always remember that you did that and you'll yeah. It's all about just thinking about solutions to problems. Um, like he cancelled the meeting, but you then thought, oh well, actually, how can I get my agenda across to him without disrupting his day and you did exactly that by going to get him and then just using that like, I think that's a fantastic um fantastic thing that's, that's a really good story I'll give you um, an example Dan, Dan Daniel G um he uh, he was yeah, what you say next Nick please be, be, be <laughs> kind he once flew to New York for one meeting for like a half an hour meeting you know I mean that is that is commitment that is saying right I've, I can see this potential here 
and I'm willing to go to a different continent for a half an hour meeting. You know, sometimes <laughs> you're thinking, can I be bothered to go to Exeter? You know, <laughs> this guy went to a different continent. So, you know, that's the level you've got to get to. Your I'm, not sure my, I'm not sure my carbon carbon footprint was that great <laughs> for it, but maybe that's a different, a it different was, story. It went very well, and, you know, I'm sure Dan will tell you, but it, it, was, it was worthwhile. Yeah, that one definitely was actually in truth. So, and yeah, some risk the... you take though, some some will work, some won't, and that's just yeah. part and parcel of of life. Not every risk you take will pay off, but sometimes you know you just got to go for it. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But without taking that step to that risk, you'll never know what way it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, Jody, I saw we had a had a question from Casper I did. in the in the chat. I did, Casper. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask um, Nick yourself, or I can read out for you, whatever you prefer. Sure, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, Casper, that's perfect. Um, yeah, so I was just sort of as you touched upon your own journey and obviously going from uni and kind of finding your way into sport, um, I was sort of wondering, like applying that to kind of nowadays, 2021, um, for people thinking about athlete management, um, sort of football and other things, what are your thoughts on kind of needing the like legal sort of background and the kind of coming trying to get into it sort of with the with those kind of qualifications rather than doing a completely different degree at university for example um so so it's a question um is it still possible to get into be, become a sports agent with a law degree as opposed to a different degree as in say you're doing a degree like i don't know geography um or something like that and you want to become a sports agent but you've never really, you don't, you've never been interested in law or sort of mm -hmm. any of that side of it kind of thing. Mm. I don't think that's a barrier to entry at all. My degree was in philosophy with Spanish. So, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's more about what you do, you know, there, there are lots of graduates who apply and, um, you know, obviously if someone's done a degree in, you know, in, sports business or, or something like that then um what you think they've learned you know they've learned you know some some parts of the industry but i mean there, there's still the sort of 90 percent of the industry that you that you that one has to learn so um i wouldn't be i wouldn't be concerned about that you know i think what you need to demonstrate are um the skills required to be you know a, a sports agent if that's what you want to do athlete management and um and, um, and and basically your ability to execute that. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think the degree is, is in any way a, um, a barrier to entry. What I would do is I would try and do as many internships as possible um, with companies and um, show that you, you've got the work ethic to do it and that you've picked up because what you pick up working for a sports agency um, is, you know, worth you know, many degrees from my perspective, you know, the degree I think is really important, but the actual day-to-day -day running the sports agency is, um, is, you know, that, that's, that's stuff that you can't teach. And also what's interesting for yourself is, you know, you might work in a sports agency and decide actually this isn't what I want to do, you know? So, you know, it's very good for both parties to have that exposure. And I think the best way to do it is to, through an internship, you know, even if you've got to go and work, for free for someone for a little while on, on one of your you know school or university holidays um they're, they're not easy jobs to get you know because we have a lot of those applications but i would just try where you can and get some actual real life experience of working in the industry thanks That's very much one. for that cheers i noticed as well um, in the comments that jason said Cassidy, well, a good step for me was internship so that just mirrors what um what nick was saying and making your mark learn 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 in um in your spare time. Um, I saw that Ollie had his hand up and there's also a question from Miles as well. So we'll go to Ollie first and then Miles, if that's okay. Uh, evening, guys. Evening, Jody. Evening, Nick. Evening, Dan. I want to say thank you for putting this on. It's been a great time. And um, to my question to Nick, um, currently I work in, as a scout at the moment uh, for FC Michelin. And in, more, in my role, um, data has impacted my as a scout. And I was just wondering from an agent's perspective, how has data impacted your role? For example, like when you're going into a boardroom, are you using data to uh, help portray your clients to clubs now or 
if, so yeah, I mean, that's just my question at the moment, just to see how from an yeah, aging group, how data has impacted you. Data has become more and more important in you know in our in our sales pitch because you know it, it helps it fuels your your argument or your you know your your pitch mm-hmm. to um, you know because you you know through data you can compare players you know. Uh, clubs often say, you know, we want better than what we've already got, and um, data is not subjective, you know. So whilst whilst it's unlikely that you'll sign a player just based on data, if you've got data to support your argument, then um, I think it's really important. And I think there are, you know, there are companies that are you know, more and more now that are doing really well by by providing those services both to agents but also to clubs. You know, everyone wants to increase the chances of their investment working out and um you know both agent and club side you know and i think you know done the right way uh, clubs will actually be quite grateful that you're providing this this data mm-hmm. to support that argument others will do the data you know themselves i mean Michelin and brentford are obviously you know great examples of of, of where data has been really you know been, played an integral part of their recruitment and you know and obviously worked really well and we see that more and more now with other clubs I think the the model of the old, the manager who just makes all the decisions, you know, based on players that he's seen, is, uh, is becoming more and more redundant, and I, I don't think that will, will that will exist in in the not too far distant future. I might just add one other point to that as well, Nick, if that's okay. Which is some of the um, agency clients we work with as well when it comes to either renegotiations or transfer negotiations. Are they is um, that they'll actually engage data companies to be able to benchmark their player against either the players that are at the club already with their valuations, either wage or transfer valuations, or benchmark across um, top leagues um, or top individuals that are in the same position as them, but maybe younger or older to show potential or otherwise. And what can sometimes happen is, interestingly, it's as much for the negotiation to obviously try and push the value of the player up um, in terms of how much they they should be earning usually. Um, But sometimes it can be quite an interesting tool for then the club to take back to its own team to be able to justify extra resources in particular ways as well. So um, it can usually be done to fulfil a number of different um, uh, points. Now, the data that you're talking about might be slightly different to the the valuation data that we're talking about um, but in the same way, it's all cut in different ways in order to justify a particular position in the end. Interesting. Well, just just to add value um, to the question that like in the when you're doing like a player evaluation, like where he's going to go to in terms of X amount, what kind of data are you using, Nick, in terms of your models? Like, is it goals scored? Like, what are you using in terms of? I mean, I think goals scored is this sort of the easy one. You know, yeah. um, that's one that you don't really need much uh, sort of data analysis. Yeah. For. But, you know, everything from, um, you know, chances created, um, you know, as a centre back, you're looking at all kinds of um, percentage of duels won, um, pass completion, um, clean sheets, you know, every sort of part of it folds into one, um, you know, more... Uh, um, in-depth evaluation of a player, um, but um, yeah, there, there are multiple things that a, that a club will look for. You know, distance covered for a midfielder, interceptions. You know, all, all different kind of things depending on what your narrative is for the player. All right, thank you very much. My Maya, so, sorry, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question too. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, firstly, Dan and, and Jody, thanks so much for arranging this month. It's really great and I get a lot out of it. Um, by the way, I'm a lawyer. I'm in Cape Town in South Africa. I'm a labor lawyer and I've got a big interest in sports law. Um, I just want to prelude my question with a bit of a gripe, which I think Nick might potentially have thoughts on. Um, Mino Raiola, right? So obviously one of the prominent agents and a controversial guy in the football industry. Um, I've just, over a period of time, been thinking there are quite a few instances where I feel that he's acted in probably what's contrary to the best interests or what I see as the best interests of his clients in terms of specifically, well, in a footballing sense, money-wise, it's probably probably different. 
But I would say, I mean, just as very quick examples, um, we know that Lorenzo and Senior and him broke up as agents and clients years ago or a while back. Um, and it seemed like it was because he was pushing for Insignia to leave Napoli, where he will probably spend his whole career. But we don't know. We're just reading him from media reports. Then you've got like Justin Kleiber to basically burn bridges with um, the club where his dad played and where, um, you know, interestingly, the next season had a fantastic Champions League run. He got shipped off to Roma um, uh, and probably made lots of money as did Mina Raiola, uh, but I don't think it was in his best interest for sure from a footballing perspective. And that was a guy, Brian Brobby. I've got a big interest in Dutch football, so that's why I'm mentioning that. But there's a guy called Brian Brobby. He's just left Ajax. 19, Ajax will be in the Champions League next season. be fantastic to start as a striker there. Anyway, that's um, that. That's that. But my, my thinking is that, you know, in these instances, I reckon, and we know Mina Raiola's got massive um, commissions, cuts out of deals transfers and obviously that's in excess of as far as I understand well in excess of what he gets in, in, in the case of contract extensions and so on um, so that's my gripe and I'm just wondering whether you have any thoughts on that in terms of you know the potential conflict of interest that lies there um, and this and how that ties into the second part of my question or what I wanted to raise which is your thoughts on um, the potential cap on commissions um, thanks for the question. Um, Mina Raiola is one that kind of divides opinion um, quite a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I can see both sides to a, every argument with him. And, and, I, and I'll qualify this by saying I don't know Mino personally, but I've heard him talk, you know, a few times. Um, I've heard him debate, you know, and put his points forward. Um, I mean, I, I think where he's, you know, he, he's certainly controversial and where he's, you know, he's put himself out there and, and attracted a lot of negative uh, media attention. Um, I think that's well documented. Um, one, thing, one thing I would say from an agent's perspective is he, he doesn't have, he's so confident in his players' um, desire to be represented by him that Mina Rael is one of the few agents that doesn't have a representation contract with his players so all of his players could leave tomorrow you know they could just go and sign and there's plenty of other big agents out there George Mendes you know Pini Zahavi and um, there's big agents out there and they will all try and poach Mina Rael as players that's what agents do particularly if when they're out of contract and yet it actually compared to a lot of other agents, he doesn't really lose that many players. Um, he's ruthless, certainly, you know, and that's possibly a culture thing that, that sort of gripes a little bit against, um, you know, against the, the certain cultures in, you know, in, in certain countries. Um, and he, he, and he ruthlessly goes after the interests of his player, you know, whereas someone like George Mendes is a bit more diplomatic, you know, and sees the benefits of a more long-term relationship, you know, and if you, you know, for instance, Alex Ferguson has been a big fan of, of Mendes, you know, and they've brought some great players to him and they, they've lost players, you know, Mendes has taken players away from United as well. But I think that's a, the sign for me, the good, well-respected agent is someone where you can take players away and still, you know, maintain a good relationship with the club um you know as for as for you know I, I think an interesting one which you know which i i think you'll get people who come down on both sides of is is the the paul pogba one was the one that really attracted attention in terms of him taking too much money um but what Raiola did is, you know, he, he obviously sat down with his client. He didn't want the to agree the terms that Man United were were offering him, and um, you know they 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 didn't have that long to wind down their contract. And they knew at the end of that season he was going to be a free agent. And you're talking about one of the most valuable players in the world, or potentially has the potential to be one of the most valuable players in the world. And um, you know it was, uh, you know, he has such a strong negotiating position. You know, and I think what he said to, to clubs is, look, um, I'm bringing you this player, right, with one of the most promising players in the world. He's going to make you absolute millions. He's going to be great for your team. When you eventually sell him, he's going to make you millions, right? I'm bringing him to you, this opportunity to you for training compensation only, okay, which was you know, 500,000 pounds roughly. 
Um, already he'd been worth, you know, several millions. You know, he said, look, I'm going to bring this player to you for next to nothing, right? What I'm asking for is when you do sell him for absolutely millions, that I'm just getting a cut of that. So I want 20% of that I think he took. Okay, so um, I'm not asking for anything extraordinary now, but I'm asking for when you guys make millions for the player, this opportunity that I've closed with you, that I'm, I'm also not, you know, forgotten in this deal. And I think possibly because it was so high profile and because it was, you know, back to Man United and for so much money, you know, it, um, it, it just seemed like a, a completely ludicrous amount of money to take as an agent's fee. But I think yeah. conceptually, right, as a, as a kind of a deal, and, and, and I think if you were to take this out of football, you know, if you were to put this into another industry, you know, conceptually, I don't think there's anything, you know, that extraordinary about the way that deal was structured. Um, but, um, you know, notwithstanding that, you know, he, um, he, there, there's, there's, you know, that he does rub clubs up the wrong way. There's not a lot of respect for the clubs or the fans. Um, you know, I, I, so I can see both sides to the coin with Mina Raiola. I certainly as a club wouldn't really want to be dealing with him because you, you just know eventually down the line, you're going to have issues, you know, um, but the fact that he you know, represents the big players and he does the biggest deals, you know, shows that as an agent, he's pretty effective. Yeah. Interestingly, thanks, Nick. That's really insightful. Really, really interesting. Um, interestingly, he's, I don't know if you know, Stephen Berghaus, who plays for uh, the Netherlands. Um, he's going across to Ajax from Feyenoord, which is kicked up. Mm. And he's a, a Mino client, I believe, which is quite interesting. Um, but I, I'm with you in terms of like, if I could just say from my perspective, um, it's a bittersweet thing really because I quite like the rogue side of Mino, but then intellectually, you know, the some of the stuff he does is sort of maybe reprehensible a little bit. Maybe that's a bit too strong a word. Um, yeah, and, and I think I, I can see exactly what you're saying. Um, and I think there are, that's really fascinating. I forgot about that, but you, uh, you know, that you mentioned about the, in fact, he doesn't have a contract, doesn't have agreements in place with his, with his clients, um, which is really, really fascinating. But I suppose the, the test will be long term, mm. whether we see in 10 years or whatever it is, whether he has established relationships in the industry, where, you know, which are still of, of similar value to what he has now. I mean, we know, I know you mentioned United and Mendes. I know that Ferguson, I think it was, um, basically wrote off Raiola at one point, or at least the club that, and I know Ajax, which is where Mina Raiola really got his break in the early 90s, didn't deal with him for, I think maybe they are now. I can know Ryan Krafenberg, who plays for Ajax now, who's a massive prospect, is a Raiola client, but for a long time, didn't deal with him at all. So mm. certainly burned a few bridges, but I, I suppose we'll see in the long term um, how it all plays out and what the impact's been of his moves and the way he operates. Yeah, I, I think the only thing that sustains him in the industry is the level of players that he signs and represents. You know, if he if he didn't have such world class players, I think clubs would just you know just refuse yeah. this with him. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Well, look, um, we're we're past half past and it's gone very quickly, and um, but we always try and keep it to that amount of time just so that um, Nick doesn't feel obliged to have to stay for too much longer, and then just to keep everybody on track. Um, but if I can just then briefly say before Jody closes up, Nick, I think that was. Um, yeah, an expert um, appraisal of a lot of the intricacies of the sports and football agency landscape that I think a lot of people wouldn't have appreciated and understood the the nuances of. So I think it was, um, yeah, a fantastic hour spent. I, I learned an awful lot as usual. And, um, you know, most importantly, we'll, we'll get this up um, on various channels because I think these sort of yeah, words of wisdom are, uh, yeah, are really great to be able to, to share uh, far and wide. So on behalf of everybody, Nick, thanks very much for, for, for joining us. Yeah, no problem. It's, uh, it's great, to, great to be on. And, and you know, I, I try and do sort of little snippets of, of this and previous talks and other things like that on, on social media. So um, I, if anyone wants to, to follow on there on LinkedIn, it's just Nick Robinson Standard. And, and on Instagram, we're doing a little bit, which is Nick Robinson Sport. So um, if, you, if you want more, more of this kind of stuff, then, uh, then that's where it is.
Yeah, I can only echo what Dan said as well, Nick. Thanks very much. It was really insightful, um, especially not from me anyway, if not even really been involved or knowing anything about a sport agent. Um, that was a really quick overview, but really deep detail as well about the kind of life of, of an agent. So um, I'm sure everyone found it just as, as insightful for me. So thanks again for, for your time.